Okay, hello and welcome to today's webinar. Um, thanks to those of you who have joined us uh, for this UK Australia Free Trade Agreement webinar. My name is Stuart Keane. I'm a Global Engagement Manager at the Australian Trade and Investment Commission and also the Head of Community at FinTech Australia, Australia's peak industry body for financial technology. Um, today's session is aimed at supporting tech businesses, both in Australia and the UK, to understand and utilise the Free Trade Agreement and to help you conduct cross-border trade and investment activities between the two countries. As you may know, the Free Trade Agreement entered into force on the 31st of May this year, and further to that, it's very important that businesses understand what's in the FTA for them and how to use it, and that's why we're here today. So to that end, Austrade, the Australian Government's Trade and Investment Promotion Agency, and the UK Government's Department for Business and Trade have partnered together to deliver this joint webinar. And we're really thrilled to have all of you here with us today as well. Um, before we go on, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we are, uh, are on across Australia, um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, Islander peoples, and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. For everyone's reference, we are recording today's webinar, um, so we will make it available via Austrade and DBT at a later date. If you're able to, or if you have to jump off early, that's absolutely fine. We will share the recording around. Um, and while I'm on that housekeeping, please do feel free to put any questions in the chat box as they pop up into your mind, because I will be addressing the questions later on as we go through. Today, we're, we're joined by some amazing panelists. So I'm very, very excited to introduce them very briefly, and then we'll go into some, some deep dive questions with them later on. Um, we have Richard Cowan, the UK Consul General uh, based in Brisbane, Anastasia Nisnianitsa, the Australian Trade and Investment Commissioner um, based in, in London, Lisa Eisen, CEO and founder of Skyjed, and George Riddell, Director of Trade Strategy at EY in the UK. This is one of two webinars for tech businesses that we're delivering on the Australia-UK Free Trade Agreement. Today, of course, we'll focus on fintech or financial technology. And then in a week from now, at the exact same time of day, on the 26th of July, we're covering broader tech. Um, so a very specific focus on financial services today and the next week, broader technology will be covered. Today, we'll proceed by firstly providing an overview of the two-way trade and investment um, flows across um, the free trade region, so Australia and the UK. Then we will cover some of the macro trends in Australia and the UK. Uh, that's important because the businesses opportunity, the business opportunities are the reason why you should be interested in this trade agreement and why you should come to your amazing support staff to tap into their knowledge uh, to understand how you can utilize these benefits. We will then move on to a panel discussion focused on how business can utilize the FTA to, to their advantage. Uh, and we're very grateful to have both Lisa and George on the panel to, to join us there. Um, at the end, as I mentioned, we'll have time for some Q&A, so please do feel free to put your, your questions in the chat box and, and we'll go from there. So having provided that introduction, I'd like to now provide a snapshot of the two-way trade across the markets, um, trade and investment, I should say, uh, and a quick overview of the free trade agreement. Okay, so you can all see those amazing and impressive numbers there. Um, so this is the existing trade and I guess the trade prior to the ratification of the free trade agreement that was occurring between Australia and the UK. So some very large and meaningful numbers, but actually as we go on, as the free trade agreement comes into force, hopefully these numbers are increasing rapidly and your export dollars are growing enormously. Um, so obviously some really awesome headline figures here. Australia is UK's 25th largest trading partner um, and the UK actually exported over $10 billion worth of um, 10 billion pounds, <laughs> I should say, worth of goods and services to Australia in 2022. Um, on the other side, in 1920, the UK and it was Australia's fifth largest trading partner and the exports were worth over 21 billion Australian dollars. So really, really meaningful figures there. Um, and actually you can see on that right-hand side as well, the UK is Australia's second largest source of investment and investment in 2019 reached $686 billion into Australia. We'll jump onto the next slide, thank you. So the agreement overview, what is the free trade agreement? Very high level points. So it was signed in December, 2021 uh, and 18 months later on the 31st of May, 2023, um, it was entered into force. 
Uh, this is actually a really exciting time for financial technology businesses. Austrade, Global Victoria and Investment New South Wales were leading a fintech delegation in London at the time. So on the 31st of May, there were 14 Australian financial technology businesses at level 39 on Canary Wharf. Level 39 is the fintech accelerator or hub in the UK. Um, and we had a panel, couple of panel discussions and networking events so that Australian businesses could connect with uh, UK fintech businesses and vice versa. Uh, and actually was, was on the 31st of May, which I think is really, really meaningful. Um, some other bits and pieces about the free trade agreement. There are 32 chapters, there are four annexes, there are nine side letters and more than 2000 pages. But importantly for us, there is a chapter on financial services. There's also a chapter on innovation. And so that's uh, very relevant for FinTech businesses. We'll jump onto the next slide, thank you. So some of the benefits of the free trade agreement um, for, for yourselves. Uh, you can see those points there, but businesses can, can consider that the deal eliminates tariffs on exports and it goes further than any um, Australia or UK trade agreement that, they, that we had had previously. Uh, it also supports the economy for future, um, for, future uh, for future through the dedicated innovation chapter that I had mentioned before. The deal includes ambitious commitments to work together in addressing the shared challenges of environmental conservation women's economic empowerment and poverty reduction. And it includes Australia's first ever development on, um, on gender equality and chapters that relate to that. So um, uh, very, very important as well. Jump on to the next slide, thank you. I've got some, um, some highlights and some advantages of the free trade agreement. So the removal of tariffs, of course, that applies to, to some services businesses, but also uh, very impactful goods businesses um, and exporters of, of food and agri and things like that as well. Um, it allows businesses to trade and invest more freely, creating opportunities for Brits and Aussies to collaborate on shared challenges. Some of the highlights there, are, as I mentioned, removal of tariffs, improved digital trade, the financial services chapter and innovation chapter, uh, and the world's first chapter dedicated to innovation and strategic innovation dialogues that drive commercialization of new technologies. So it's, uh, it's not just the fluffy word of innovation, it's actually meaningful things um, that, that can help drive the collaboration between Australian and UK fintech businesses, um, leveling up the Australia-UK fintech bridge, which has been enforced for a number of years now, taking it to that next level so we can collaborate further with potential partners uh, in the UK. A piece that we will hear about later is the mobility of people as well. So um, access to, to great talent, which is something that I know at FinTech Australia, some of our member companies are, are struggling with or have struggled with over the past years. So increased talent, increased mobility for people to move between the two markets to do their job and to utilize those skills that they are so well versed at. Thank you, Rob. Okay, so now that I've provided that overview um, and, and we, we're getting into it, I'd actually like to uh, pass on to our market expert, uh, Trade and Investment Commissioner to London at Australia, Anna Mishnyunitsa. Thanks, Anna. Thanks very much, Stu. Um, not sure if I'm an expert, um, uh, but I have been here for a couple of years and hopefully can share some really useful insights uh, with you all. Uh, it's uh, great to see everyone on a call. Uh, good afternoon to everyone in Australia. Good morning to everyone in the UK. I will talk a little bit about uh, why UK for Australian companies and where we are seeing opportunities. And then I'll hand over to Richard to talk a little bit about uh, Australian market for the UK company. So we'll jump straight into it. Um, we'll go to the first slide. As Stuart already so well pointed out, uh, UK is an important uh, export market for Australia. It's a large market, um, um, but it's also been um, rapidly growing. And I think it's important for us to all acknowledge the fact that there's been a significant economic uh, downturn globally. It has impacted UK, absolutely. You might have seen a lot in the media about the um, uh, 
the significant inflation of 10%, um, the cost of living crisis, they are all the realities within which we operate. And as businesses um, expand to the markets like the UK, they do need to be mindful of that. However, within that kind of complexity and that environment, it is still one of the largest technologies markets in the world. And it is still uh, one of the markets that attracts the largest amount of investment into tech uh, businesses. It's the market that grows uh, uh, and um, a significant number of unicorns, um, startups and scale ups. And it is a market that still ranks really highly for innovation. Um, so uh, interestingly, while we have seen significant tightening up around um, VC investment around the world, uh, UK still outperforms uh, all of the major countries. It's in the, uh, the I guess, the smallest reduction compared to um, others like the US, um, and it is still ranked uh, really high up there as number three, and it is uh, performing everyone else um, in Europe um, significantly. So it's still a very attractive market uh, for tech businesses. So if we go to the next slide, we'll zero in a bit more in terms of what it means for fintechs. Um, so a significant fintech market, uh, 2,500 uh, fintechs across uh, banking, uh, lending, insurtech, uh, reg tech, payments, wealth tech, you name it. Um, so there is a very strong uh, fintech ecosystem that exists in the UK. Um, we are seeing uh, that there's also a really high level of adoption and engagement in financial um, services technology across UK citizens. Uh, so some interesting stats there around the 71% of UK citizens uh, at least using one fintech, uh, the adults moving to having digital only uh, bank accounts, uh, and that's really accelerating and rapidly uh, growing. I uh, mentioned investment. Uh, UK is an attractive destination for those companies that uh, looking to raise VC funds and uh, fintech is actually uh, one of the strongest areas of investment in the UK. Um, it's only the level of fintech investment in the UK is only second to the US uh, and it's well ahead uh, India who's ranked third in the world for specifically uh, fintech investment. Uh, so it does perform uh, really well uh, and it does offer you a very welcoming environment so Stu touched on a little bit on the Australia UK fintech bridge and the regulators working together, uh, which is obviously a great advantage. But outside of that, uh, the UK's regulations always been ahead of the curve when it comes to financial services. Uh, so there's been a number of, um, I guess, initiatives uh, over the last 10 years that made it a very interesting and attractive environment for fintech businesses to innovate and really uh, was driving this creation of a strong you know, fintech ecosystem in the UK. So whether it's the open banking um, legislation, which UK led on, and then um, Australia adopted it into the consumer data rights, uh, whether it's the review of its current uh, payments uh, regulation, um, adoption of uh, uh, of uh, PSD2 to really um, kind of even out the playing field and encourage more innovation and financial services, um, the support uh, of PRAs to for, uh, to offer new banking license, which led to the significant creation of new banks. All of that uh, has created a really exciting environment and the UK is still working hard to lead the way. And um, uh, for example, uh, there, there are some real, there's some real progress that's currently being made here on the development of the central bank digital um, currency and really looking at how the, the legislation regulation can stand, stay ahead of the curve, um, which is quite interesting. Um, the uh, Financial Conduct Authority uh, in the UK, so equivalent to ASIC in Australia, um, also have a number even of sandboxes that they run uh, to offer companies opportunity to innovate and um, test their product. Uh, and they also offer an innovation hub pathway uh, to uh, businesses. So very, very attractive environment from a regulatory perspective. Um, of course, uh, 
The UK is home to one of the largest global financial centres, um, being uh, London, uh, which is quite attractive. Uh, and it also has a pretty strong pool of talent. Uh, we will talk about competition of talent. We'll talk about mobility later. Uh, but let's face it, having such a strong ecosystem around fintech, having such strong um, ecosystem around financial services means that there are a lot of um, uh, there is a lot of talent uh, in the financial um, services industries that you can tap into. And uh, finally, I would say all of this has led to the fact that UK fintechs have been um, growing at a much higher rate, rate to any other um, uh, businesses as well with tech, I guess, scale up businesses here in, here in the UK. I think that environment has a lot um, to do with it. So if we go to the next slide, just a couple of areas of opportunity that we think exist for companies. They're basically the key trends that we are observing in the UK market um, and you might be want to look into and explore further. We will think that open banking will continue to gain momentum um, here in the UK um, and obviously with the consumer data rights in Australia there's a lot of similarities and opportunities for um, adoption across both markets. We, we are seeing greater collaboration between fintechs and traditional financial institutions here in the UK market which is really exciting and really opening up more opportunities for partnerships for Australian fintechs. Um, there is a strong focus on um, cryptocurrencies and digital assets. Um, here, uh, we're all quite concerned about um, uh, cyber security. So any solutions that are helping us uh, secure or better regulate and manage how financial services uh, are administered uh, are very popular in this market. Uh, there's a high level of adoption of artificial intelligence um, across an integration into fintech uh, services. There's also obviously a lot of focus on the cost of living crisis and how financial uh, technology can uh, help uh, access to finance more equitable and affordable and uh, address some of the uh, uh, I guess uh, inequalities in the system and find people and help people find uh, better affordable offerings and solutions um, a strong focus on sustainable finance uh, is sustainability ESG is a big topic across the UK um, and I think we will continue to see more and more integration in the financial services in this market so the topic of embedded finance and decentralized finance remain to be front of mind for everyone so there's some areas that you might want to consider if you're thinking about uh, the UK market and the FTA will make it easier so before before we go in into the detail on FTA, I will talk. I will hand over to Richard to talk about a bit more about opportunities in the other direction. So over to you, Richard. Thank you very much, Anna, and uh, good evening from Brisbane, everybody. It's great to be joining you uh, across Australia and back there in the UK. Uh, look, so um, if we could move on to my first slide, please. We'll dive straight into it. Um, just to say a few things about the Australian market. Um, so some messages that I would like you to remember and can I take home from, from today. I think the first thing is that Australia's financial services sector punches well above its weight. It's a $10 trillion, that's $10 trillion Australian dollar or $5 trillion UK pound financial sector. It's got the world's fifth largest pool of pension assets. And uh, some of Australia's banks are also among the world's largest banks by market capitalization. And specifically on fintech, it's a $4 billion industry with 800 fintech companies here in Australia. The second thing I'd like you to remember about Australia is that it's really tech savvy. I've been here for six months and I, I mean, I jokingly say that I hardly know what Australian money looks like because Australian contactless payments, Australian apps are so good, so well advanced, so easy to use. And then the third and final thing that I'd ask you to remember about the Australian market is that Australian consumers are really rich as well. So, I mean, that's a, another slight joke, but actually higher disposable income rates here are you know, quite different to those in the UK. Anyway, just to keep things moving, let's go on to uh, the next slide and look a little bit more about why Australia and uh, why it might be a good market uh, for you. So um, the first thing that I would say is I think Australia has the right 
legislation in place to make it good for you as UK fintech companies. Uh, we've already heard the consumer data rights uh, mentioned uh, this evening, it went live in 2020. It gives consumers greater access control over their data. It's very similar to the UK legislation that passed in 2017. And potentially as a UK company, that gives you a little bit of a head start if you've been active in the fintech sector and active in that data space, because it's being rolled out here and there's a big demand and Australia is very keen uh, to buy in and look at new products. So, in this Why Australia space, the second thing that I would say is uh, Australia's big banks and uh, fintech sector really wants to invest. Uh, recently, we were talking to one of the big four banks here and they were telling us uh, how they're investing in fintechs, that they've set up a uh, specific fund for doing this. Um, they've already invested in two UK companies and they were looking, um, you know, they don't want to in-house this. They've tried it, it's difficult. Uh, they want to be able to buy this in. So they are looking for more products in personal banking, uh, in mortgages, in wealth management, and in trade finance. Um, we've also heard the UK Australia FinTech Bridge mentioned this evening. You know, that is supporting companies in, in both directions. And uh, we've had about 50 UK FinTechs coming through that program and operating successfully here in Australia. So, in this, in this space on why Australia, I mean, the, the kind of third point I would like to land with you is people have been really, really successful here. Look, you've got that, that visual there in front of you of all of the different people that have had success, but you know, special shout outs to Revolut, Wise, Currency Bound and Record Sure. So all of that kind of means that there's big demand, you know, big demand for your payment technologies, big demand for your rate tech, uh, and big demand for things around financial crime and fraud prevention. Uh, but then if we could move on to the next slide, um, my, my last slide, um, and I know I'm moving through things quite quickly here, but I just wanna make sure that we do have time for questions, because I think that's probably the most rewarding part of, uh, of, the, of the evening for us. But um, just looking at this point quickly, collaborating for the future. Look, Isaac, the Australian regulator is progressive, it has an innovation hub and it wants to work closely with fintech companies. The free trade agreement has built upon a fantastic relationship and locks us into dialogue and regulatory cooperation for the future. And that strategic stability for the future is another thing that makes Australia a really good market for you. Because I think the things that worry people at the moment in international trade and fintech are the security and reliability of your supply chains, uh, data and ESG. And the free trade agreement locks us into strategic conversations around all of that and surety on our data uh, control and our data regulations. So it does really do something different uh, and bring opportunities for you. And then just um, what I'd like to say quickly, and people have kind of alluded to, is that this whole industry, as you know, I mean, I don't need to tell you this, but it's built on human capital, right? So we need to get people moving in both directions, talking to each other, um, and that means kind of increased mobility, and we'll probably come on to that a little bit later in the question point um, and unpack some of that for you. But um, finally, just to end on all of this, I'd like to give a plug for some of the events that we've got coming up and invite you to take part in those. So next month, we've got a UK FinTech trade mission to Australia. And then in October, we've got a UK digital trade mission to Australia. So please do get in touch. We'd love to have you come along and join us as part of that. Um, and we'll be very happy to share further details with you. So um, I'll close there and pass back to Stu. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, that's great. And we are very excited from the FinTech Australia side to welcome the, the delegates at the end of August over for Intersect Festival. So those of you who are sitting on the webinar, hoping you'll be able to meet some of the great FinTechs that are coming from the UK. If you're attending FinTech Australia's Intersect Festival across the 30th and 31st of August, then you will have that chance. Um, great. Okay. So we're going to jump into the panel discussion now, and that means I'll welcome Lisha um, back to the panel and also Ed to the panel. Great. And actually what we'll start with, Lisa, if you could give a quick introduction and um, a little bit of information on Sky, did that would be great. And then we'll do the same from Ed and then I'll, I'll jump into some questions for everyone. 
Thanks, yeah, thanks Stuart. So, hi, hi everyone. So, I'm uh, Lisa Rice, and so I founded Skyjet around about five years ago. So, Skyjet's a product lifecycle and governance um, platform, and uh, we launched in Australia. So, I think we're a real live example of what we're talking about today. So, now scaling here um, into the UK market as part of our, our growth strategy. And then I'll throw it over to George Riddell from EY. Thanks, George. Ryan, great to be here. So George Riddell, I'm a director of trade strategy at EY based in our UK team. And what we do is sort of working with my team is help clients overcome some of those trade challenges that, that have been mentioned um, that, that are happening around the world and really take advantage of, of the different trade agreements. Being Australian originally, um, but here in the UK, have a particular interest in making sure that the UK Australia FTA is as successful as possible. And George, we might dive a little bit deeper on that. So, what are the big opportunities you're seeing now for Australian companies or for UK companies, um, specifically, actually, with regards to procurement? If you have any examples, that would be great. Sure. So, I think you know it, it's about. We going through the presentation, there's obviously a lot of different aspects of the FTA, and I think that's one of the challenges for businesses when they're confronted with these, you know, 100 page long legal texts, you know, quite large documents as to what does it actually mean for them in practice. And I think, is, as you say, there's three main areas on the, the fintech side where there are, you know, significant um, benefits to the agreement. The first is that mobility piece, um, both in the UK and Australia, it is now easier for Australians to come here to work in the UK and, and vice versa with, in Australia with new visa routes being opened up. Data flows is obviously something that's incredibly important, making sure that that's put on a, on a proper legal footing when you're operating between the two jurisdictions and there's no concerns that suddenly you're not going to be able to transfer and process that data. And then when it comes to procurement, I mean, both nations have a fairly open procurement system um, in terms of sort of who can bid for government contracts. But that said, there are additional um, benefits with some of those thresholds being lowered. So more procurement opportunities that have published in, and issued by both governments are now available to be bid on um, by Australian companies here in the UK. So making sure that you're checking that Crown Commercial Service procurement portal, um, I think is a, is a pretty good start there because, you know, Australian companies now have that ability to, to be yeah, bidding for those procurement opportunities. Yeah, it's a great point and lots of opportunities there for sure. Um, thank you very much, George. Lisa, I'm keen to hear on, on the opportunities you're seeing for your business as obviously a founder and executive officer at Skyjet. Yeah, well, look, I think, I mean, before I dive into some of the details, I, Probably the key point I'll make is just around the, you know, the growth opportunity in in this market for for fintechs and regtechs and tech companies because you know for for me um, with Skyjet it was it was a strategic decision in the business plan to enter into this market because of you know the size and the diversity of um, businesses over here particularly in that kind of mid mid market and um, top tier um, enterprises over here. And uh, so it was part of our, our growth decision to, to come into the market, but also we started to get um, uh, triggered, you know, requests from companies over here to, to find out about our um, solution. So that's why we entered into this market and it's, it's been the base um, for our growth over here. So we're, I think we're a great example. We're scaling rapidly. We've got more than 100 companies on the platform now. and. Since I've entered this market, you know, the other point I would make is once once that you get over here, it's an excellent sort of footprint and springboard to be able to base yourself for um, opportunities also in adjacent markets in, in Europe and to be able to you know work effectively in the time zone when you're based over here. So definitely that growth opportunity. And then I think, you know, probably the other point I'd make when when you're scaling out a, you know, a technology sort of software business, when you're entering in the market, that area around, you know, mobility of staff is really important. 
not just in being able to attract um, top talent to build out your team, which is what I've been doing, um, been doing over here, but when you're in that market expansion stage and sort of scaling and um, building out your go-to-market plan, you also, you know, want to be able to bring people across from your Australian team to to set in that foundation. So in my example, I've come across here and I've recruited a team. I've had some of the Australian expertise come off and um, we're rapidly building out the team here. So just that talent mobility at that scaling stage, I think is um, is an important um, area for, for fintechs and, and tech companies. Sound advice, especially for the early stage of the people are so, so important and integral in a business. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, we're going to jump over to Richard now, uh, and I have a question about the purpose of a free trade agreement. I mean, how can it, in practical terms, a free trade agreement support export success? Stu, so look, the really obvious thing about free trade agreements is that they eliminate tariffs, and this agreement has eliminated pretty much all tariffs between Australia and the UK. But I would say that's a short term tactical bit. The long term strategic bit about this free trade agreement is locking the UK and Australia together into future kind of standards, future collaboration. And there's some really big areas that we're doing this in. So it's greater regulatory cooperation. Uh, people have already mentioned commitments on uh, procurement. Uh, we've got recognition of qualifications. Uh, there's things like electronic verification of uh, documents and signatures. And we've also talked a lot about migration. So perhaps I'll pause there and allow others to come in and elaborate a little bit. But it's it's about locking us together, locking us uh, into uh, a space where we could be confident about the future because when you're confident about the future you trade well together um, and you know that's the basis of the uk australia relationship you trade with people you trust good point i think you set the platform perfectly for um for hopefully george to provide any examples he has of of companies that you're working with at ey who are actually utilizing this george so I think just to drill down into, into one of those points uh, that Richard and others have made around regulatory cooperation, it's quite a nebulous concept in, in, you know, when we're just saying it here on the webinar, but what does that really mean in practice? And I think, you know, practically speaking, the UK and Australian governments and regulators are going to meet, be meeting multiple times a year in order to try and address any, you know, bilateral trade frictions that could arise in the relationship going forward. And what that means for businesses is that, you know, if you have any concerns or potential issues that you experience when you're trading between the UK and Australia, please do go to DFAT or the um, Department for Business and Trade in the UK, because it's their job in order to resolve those issues through that regulatory cooperation. So it's not a one and done oh, we signed the FTA, now go off and use it. There is meant to be that sort of continuing relationship. And as businesses, I think it's incumbent on us to be bringing those concerns to, to government officials and regulators as and when they arise. Thanks, George. I think it's a really good point, especially from what we're seeing at FinTech Australia. Sometimes we say, okay, it's great. Let's have an improved dialogue between the FCA and ASIC or between our treasuries. Sometimes the industry or small startups don't actually know what that means and how they can have a voice. Industry groups like Innovate Finance, like FinTech Australia play a role there. And we actually really need the startups or the scale up businesses to voice their concerns, share their problems so that we can create an industry voice to go to the regulators with. So there is truly, or there are truly channels there but um, please ensure that you share them with your, share your voice with the industry bodies that you have there to be able to access that support. Just a, a little note from me from what we're seeing in, in the industry here in Australia. Um, okay, I'll jump over to Anna and we're actually going to speak a bit more about digital trade and, uh, and the data provision. So how do these changes that have come in through the FTA uh, impact or support the businesses that are looking to, to get involved in the two-way trade and investment? 
that's um as to and look i'll provide i guess the the the, the generic overview but maybe um lisa wants to jump in afterwards and provide something a bit more practical on this point as well um i think importantly um the agreement will enable the free flow and movement of data before between the two jurisdictions um so what does that mean in practice um you no longer have to host uh data um in in service uh, in the in a new jurisdiction um uh, you can share data across borders between the two, two um, jurisdictions and you don't have to go through the restrictive approval processes uh, that currently exist uh, to be able to uh, share and move the data across the two uh, jurisdictions which uh, i believe have also been quite costly um, for businesses as well so that that free movement of data, I think, will really benefit um, a number of businesses. But obviously, fintech is based on data, so I think that's a huge benefit for for, for fintechs um, going forward. And probably one little spin that I would add on that is I'm quite keen to also see what innovations fintech will come up now that we have this uh, movement of data between the two countries and two borders. What what else uh, can you develop and implement that can actually, um, I guess, build on this? Um, to help us do more business uh, together across the two countries. I think the other aspect of the digital trade is also around um, uh, digitizing the actual trade. Um, so that means the use of electronic contracts, the use of electronic signatures, um, uh, and really um, uh, moving to or, or transacting, moving to enabling transactions to be genuinely done digitally across borders. Um, and that's, I think, quite another quite interesting area that fintechs can leverage and build on. Um, there's already some fantastic solutions that are out there um, uh, where, where businesses are um, offering um, authentication and uh, digital signing of contracts, et cetera, but they will now be able to really build on, on these new provisions to offer that at scale um, as well, but also uh, have benefits to their own businesses in terms of uh, you know, having certainty that they can transact digitally. Um, also, um, but yeah, I'm not sure if Felicia, you wanted to kind of provide a more of a, like a business perspective on someone who's already doing it here in the UK. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Anna. So, look, I think there's a couple of um, practical examples from me. So, this uh, free flow of data is obviously a really important area because you know any kind of strategic um, software company these days uh, wants to provide you know insights to their customers and and partners, and sitting under that is is the challenge when you're scaling up is you know setting up all your infrastructure and those glo global um, data sets. That's a really important area. So in my example, it's setting up those data sets around you know product lifecycle governance. So um, setting those up, but you know enabling you to be able to um, share those uh, the data um, with you with your enterprise customers over here, but also the partners that you're partnering with. So. Um, that um, becomes really important to, you know, growing and providing value um, in, in your solution. So definitely a priority for us. And then I think a second area, which is sort of slightly related is just around, um, and I'm living this at the moment, it's just around the protection of your intellectual property. Um, obviously, like, you know, most sort of fintech, reg tech companies, over the years, um, I've invested a, you know, a, a significant amount in research and development to drive our innovation and to drive our focus on you know, the customer requirements in this market and in global markets. So being able to you know, protect that intellectual property as you're scaling and, and entering into these new markets and the protection of your, your source code is um, you know, critical to your business plan, critical to your growth. and also, um, you know, the investment that you're getting from you know, investors, they want to be able to see that you're actively, you know, protecting your intellectual property as you, you grow and innovate. So that's probably the second pragmatic area that I'd see in addition to your global data sets. Thanks for those examples, Lisa and Anna. That's great. Um, interestingly, FinTech Australia hosted some events recently in Melbourne on the consumer data right, which is our open banking model. Um, to model off that was in that was uh, crafted in the UK years before. Uh, but one of the themes of a panel discussion was data being the new oil, 
Uh, obviously, the value there is enormous. Uh, we were also in the US recently and, and met with some people at MasterCard and MasterCard are now spruiking that they are a data company, not a payments company, which we found really interesting. So just that importance now is um, is really changing data applications, IP uh, and the jurisdictional similarities and the trust that we have Australia and the UK. It just means that it's um, so much more meaningful. So thank you. Um, Richard, we're going to speak a bit more on mobility. So I have a, I have a question for you. I know we've touched on it previously uh, this morning or this evening, but people mobility provisions have been promoted as one of the major wins of the FTA. Uh, so could you please outline some of the key changes and how you see businesses benefiting from this? Yeah, sure. So I think the first thing to say is if you're under 35, there are big, big benefits to this uh, to this agreement. Unfortunately, I don't quite fall into that category, but almost, almost. Uh, look, so on both sides, the working holiday scheme, as it's commonly known, the youth mobility scheme uh, has upped its age limit to uh, age 35. Uh, from the 1st of July this year, UK passport holders have been able to apply for that uh, in Australia. Uh, and from the 1st of July uh, uh, next year, um, it will, it will, sorry, from the 31st of January next year, it will go the other way and uh, Australians uh, going to the UK will be able to have that uh, additional uh, five years um, as well. Uh, you're able to uh, extend those uh, visas for a longer time. Um, but also there are some other in addition to this, there's some other really important um, mobility provisions. So one of them is that uh, for Brits going to the UK, the uh, skilled um, the, the skilled labour list, um, which uh, the Australians uh, have in place for um, areas of skills need, has been lifted for uh, British nationals. So um, any Australian company or uh, you know, any British national going to Australia um, doesn't have to be subject to to that. And then also there's a really big important point about intra-company transfers, which have become a lot, lot easier in both directions. Thank you. And then some of the practicalities, George, are you seeing this with clients or seeing this even within your own teams or company at EY? Um, very much something that you know we're advising clients on actively when it comes to using the the new visa routes as they come online i think in terms of in that sort of combination of youth mobility and, and intercorporate transferees it's really a great opportunity and, and we're starting to take advantage of this ourselves of really promoting the the sort of young and up-and-coming talent that we have that we're able to you know really develop the careers of our people as we sort of move them between the UK and Australia, you know, gain more experiences, exposed to different worldviews and, and different business models. And I think that's something that, that is a real tangible benefit that already we're starting to see come through um, from the, the enhanced cooperation between the two countries. jump in here as well, Stu, if that's okay. I um, uh, would like to spruik a little bit um, the innovation and early exchange uh, careers pilot uh, that uh, will be launched on the 25th of September. Uh, the uh, people can already actually go and ex express interest in it, uh, but the applications will be uh, accepted from the 25th of September. So that was um, agreed under the free trade agreement as a pilot initially to uh, for uh, British um, uh, innovators uh, to come and work uh, and live in Australia and if the pilot is going is going is going to go well uh, that we, we are hoping that it will also then be reciprocated for Australian innovators to um, come over to the UK uh, so there are two streams under the pilot uh, one is for kind of early stage graduates um, who can come and work 
work in Australia for up to a year and one for more experienced innovators who can come and work in Australia for up to three years. Uh, the reason why I'm mentioning it, because I think that's a great opportunity um, to bring British talent um, over to uh, Australia, uh, both for the UK businesses who are looking, uh, who are setting up and growing their operations in Australia, and they want to bring some of their British talent across, but also for Australian businesses who are growing their Australian businesses and could tap into this amazing talent uh, pool uh, to help grow their businesses in Australia also. Um, so yeah, more information, we can provide more information if that's of interest, but I think that's also a really exciting uh, new pathway uh, to help us exchange more talent and I guess um, address some of the challenges that are out there around attracting the right um, talent. Thanks, Anna. Uh, and then on Lisa, um, obviously you spoke about your personal move over to the UK from Australia. Are you thinking about mobility for for staff and other people you're uh, within your team? Yeah, exactly, Stuart. Because I mean, as I was saying, when you sort of scaling up and and entering a new market, it's certainly about you know building out the team on the ground over here and uh, recruiting in. Um, you know, business development, customer success, and and technical roles to support you. You know, your customers as as you're growing. Um, but the second part of that is that when you've sort of got deep knowledge in your your sort of um, foundation team um, to speed up that um, process of bringing on new team members, you need to be able to kind of share that knowledge from your existing uh, teams based in Australia. So for me, it's that sort of two two things, bring, building out a talented team, but also being able to kind of bring over, like myself, or bring over other team members that can come for a period of time and you know share that knowledge um, strategically with the team so that you're growing, growing out the knowledge and the culture and the team over here. So that two way flow is, um, is important at that pragmatic entry scale growth, growth stage. Absolutely. Um, and a note to everyone now, we have about 10 minutes remaining. So I have two questions for the panel, but if you have any questions coming in from the audience, please put them in the chat box or the Q and A and I'll address them in about five minutes. So this one again for yourself, Lisa, and then George for some examples where you have them. Um, why the UK and why Australia? Obviously there are 200 plus other countries out there, but why is this market right for Skyjet? And then George, for your clients you're working with, why mm -hmm. have they chosen one of those? We'll start with Lisa, thanks. Yeah, so look, as I said, I mean, this, this market was always the sort of focus of uh, my sort of strategic um, business plan and what was what's driving that is, as I said, the size of the market, but also to some of the discussion earlier, we're a product lifecycle um, governance um, platform and the regulatory regimes over here and the, you know, the level of innovation from the, the FCA around embedding that lifecycle governance in, in your business and the oversight of your, your products for not only your customer focus, but also your, your sustainability and preventing greenwashing. They're in really important areas that are on the agenda over here, as Anna was saying. So, you know, the market is, is you know, quite mature around those. Um, I'm finding that enterprise clients in financial services, in also, you know, in energy, telco, manufacturing, et cetera, um, they are actively sort of focused on those regulatory regimes and you know lifting the standard of their product governance. So with all that happening in this market, it makes it an obvious um, opportunity in terms of the size of it. But you know, like any scale scale up business, it's all about timing. So when you're in in a market that you know there's um, there's sort of growth trends that are you know driving an agenda that's you know very very good for your sales cycle. So um, that that second dimension, I think we we have found found over here, particularly um, you know the tier one and um, you know the mid market enterprise companies over here. That sort of innovation and adopting lifecycle governance is you know firmly on their agenda. So that's um, that's quite an opportunity for for you when you're scaling up. So that was the focus for us coming over here, and 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 since being here, as I mentioned before. What I found is well, it's a lot easier being in this time zone 
uh, when you're trying to grow grow a business just practically uh, but also you know as i said the the opportunities as a springboard into the adjacent european um, countries with you know similar regulatory uh, frameworks and and uh, enterprise you know pain points that they're trying to address with innovative um, fintech and regtech those those adjacent markets are also a significant opportunity that you can tap into when you you're building out a team um, a team over here So I jump in um, quickly to sort, sort of what we what we're hearing from clients and you know sort of the th three of the factors I think have already been mentioned size of market obviously key UK is is still you know a, a big and, and decently sized market for these types of services there are the cultural factors um, you know the fact that there is a shared language and you know legal system certainly does make it easier for companies to understand the the two countries and it makes moving between the two a, a little bit easier there's also the regulatory regime and i think you know the the uk for all of shall we say the uncertainty um caused by the last couple of years and and leaving the european union the regulators and parliament are trying to to be innovative on the regulatory side um a, good sort of example of that is the electronic trade documents bill that's currently going through the UK Parliament that's looking to sort of make sure that we have the digitalization of different trade documents that you know you're no longer needing a wet stamp on a piece of paper um, for a bills of lading and other shipping documents um, and it's insane that we still have that on on the legislative books but you know really seeking to change that and i think that is going to you know play into a huge number of different trade tech services that are going to be coming online in the next little while the the final factor that i think you know important to speak about as well is the ecosystem so you know it's not just you know the one company providing the services it's also what do you have here in the uk where it's you know not just london but other hubs as well you've got you know, big financial institutions, the VCs, the, you know, specialized law firms, there is an ecosystem of financial and professional services providers that is driving a lot of innovation in the market at the moment. And I think, you know, it's, it's quite an exciting thing to be part of. Thank you, George. Um, so I'll ask the final question of Anna and then uh, Richard, if you have anything to add, please do. And then we have one question that's coming from the audience, but noting about six minutes remaining. So we'll, we'll make these ones quick fire if we can. Um, and it's the last question I have for you, uh, Anna and Richard, is with regards to the financial services chapter in the free trade trade agreement that we've, we've heard so much about. Um, it's set to eliminate barriers and improve market access, but what is there? What are those key points in the financial service chapter that we should keep a look out for? Benefit of making it short, um, I'll try to summarize it in saying that it will basically enable uh, a fintechs to operate uh, on equal footing. So, whether you are, uh, if you are in Australian fintech setting up uh, and growing an entity in the UK, you will be treated the same way as a UK fintech, and vice versa. If you're an Australian, fin uh, if you're a UK fintech setting up in Australia, you will be treated the same way as an Australian fintech. So, yes, there are still regulatory requirements that you have to pass, but there's no additional restrictive requirements that apply to you as being an international business. Those are, have been removed uh, to for you to be treated on the equal footing in each other's jurisdictions. Thanks, you. So if I could just say, answer maybe a slightly different question or make a slightly different point. People have been talking about the UK, London being a hub for European operations as well. Could I just say that Australia is also a really important hub in Asia Pacific for fintech. It's a really important test bed for many, uh, many big major international companies. It's got a really diverse population here. Its time zones work really well here. Um, so it's a great platform for that as well. Um, but totally agree with what Ada's just said about the, the FTA and the financial services regulation. With you on that, Richard. Please, UK FinTech, come and join us in Melbourne or in Sydney. Um, there's a great home for you here uh, and obviously lots of access to um, to move your people, your teams into the market, companies to connect with and partner with as well. So it's a great point. 
Now I have one question from um, from the audience, and George, I think it may be for you, but any of the panelists, I'm happy if you jump in. Does the UK have a plan to mandate e-invoicing? <laughs> Oh, um, EU invoicing is um, accepted and encouraged here in the UK. Um, HMRC have published quite detailed guidance um, on on the question of e invoicing, what standards are required, what sort of what constitutes a, a proper e, e invoice. So certainly there is, you know, an encouraging regime at the moment. Um, and also, you know, that's in the context of the broader plans around making tax digital. So we are seeing, particularly around VAT, um, quite substantial moves um, in order to get off paper-based forms and, and into sort of more regular digital transfer of data between the tax authority and individual businesses. On the question of mandatory invoicing, from my understanding at the moment, that isn't being considered, but sort of as we progress the the whole making tax digital, I would imagine that, you know, as more and more businesses start to use in e invoices that we might end up there, but we we aren't right now. Thank you, George. Was there anything to add there? Lisa, I thought you were ready to go. No, no, I was just uh, just agreeing with that with that comment. Yeah. I'm seeing seeing that similar sort of trends from my perspective, yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, well, I think we have some concluding slides and um, some information there for our participants to be able to connect with our teams. But firstly, um, and finally, I would like to, of course, thank Anna, Richard, uh, for, your, for your speaking, for your insights that you've shared, and Lisa and George as well, for those proven examples uh, and the case studies that we have. So thank you so much for joining and sharing this evening or this morning. For all of our participants, excuse me, uh, for dialing in as well, please do feel free to get in touch with Austrade or the UK DBT uh, for more information. If you would like to scale your business into Australia or the UK, they are there to support you. That concludes the session. Thank you so much.